racial, ident racial identities and inequalities, competing paradigms. And we're delighted to have with us three distinguished speakers as our main panelists. They'll each speak for about 15 to 20 minutes, and then we'll open things up to a broader uh, Q&A and comments from everyone assembled here. Our first speaker is Kathy Cohen, who is the David and Mary Winton Green Distinguished Service Professor of Political Science at the University of Chicago. Kathy is the author of numerous highly influential, extremely well-cited uh, works including her book, The Boundaries of Blackness, AIDS and the Breakdown of Black Politics, as well as her book, Democracy Remixed, Black Youth and the Future of American Politics. She's held many high-level administrative positions at the University of Chicago, including department chair, director of the University Center for Race, and deputy provost of education. Among her extensive professional activities, Kathy is the co-director of a book series from Oxford University Press, entitled Transgressing Boundaries, Studies in Black Politics and Black Communities. Uh, Desmond King is also one of our panelists today. He's a professor in the Department of Politics and International Relations at Oxford. He has broad interests in comparative government, public policy, and American political development with a special focus on issues pertaining to economic and racial inequality in the US. He's someone like the rest of our panelists whose scholarship could not be more relevant to the topic of our panel. Among his many works is the 2000 book, Making Americans, Immigration, Race, and the Origins of the Diverse Democracy. His 2012 book, co-authored with Rogers, Still a House Divided, Race and Politics in Obama's America, and his recent Fed Power, How Finance Wins. Finally, we have with us today, Adolph Reed, who's created another Grand Canyon sized crater at Penn since his retirement from the university in 2019, a legendary teacher and presence and someone who's been a treasured advisor and mentor to so many students in just my 15 years at Penn and no doubt for years before then. We're delighted to have him back with us uh, this morning. Whether in his academic work or his pieces in the popular press, Adolf is surely one of the keenest observers of the American political scene. Cornell West has called him the leading left political theorist of his generation. Like our other speakers, he's written too many books and articles for me to mention. So I'll just give a shout out to his recently released 2022 book, The South, Jim Crow and Its Afterlives. Thank you all for being here. We'll turn things over to you, Kathy, to start us off. Thank you. Sounds good. And I want to thank all the people who pulled this together. Um, such an important moment for all of us to recognize and celebrate Rogers. Um, <clears throat> I know he won't like it, but I have to start this presentation by saying a few words about my dear friend, Rogers Smith. Uh, Rogers, it seemed like, it seems like yesterday <laughs> that I walked onto the Yale University campus uh, into the political science department for a job interview, meant to do of all things, replace Adolph Reed, which we know, of course, is just not possible. But the good news is that I got the job, and more importantly, that I met Roger Smith. Well, okay, I'm not, Rogers, you're great, but I'm not sure you're more important than me getting a job. So the, the good news is that I got a job and I met Roger Smith. Um, so I know that today many will discuss his kind of groundbreaking work, the ways he's helped us dissect the work of the racial state, his introduction of his framework of multiple traditions, his writing with Des and Phil about the rise and decline of racial equality and racial orders, right? You know, we could, of course, go on, I could go on. And I have no doubt that it sounds weird saying this, in retirement, he will continue to add to really a portfolio of work that has changed our ideas about the state, about whiteness, about liberalism, and about, you know, racial orders. I just wanna say that while Rogers is clearly a brilliant scholar, I also know him as a wonderful person and a friend. <clears throat> as a young junior colleague, uh, he treated me with respect. He joined me in adventures such as starting and running the Center for the Study of Inequality at Yale. And most importantly, he and Mary and their kids welcomed me into their home and treated me like family. Rogers, I know we don't always agree on everything, but I hope you know that I have deep love and respect for you, that you are a person who has incredible integrity and you walk through the world with a commitment to doing what is right and just. 
And I feel lucky to count you as a friend and to have you in my life. Okay. Now, um, I don't mean to kind of just dismiss that, but we'll, we'll keep it moving. Uh, so Roger sent me an email and he asked me, gave me permission, told me that I would do, of course, whatever I wanted to, to present my own work and that not to kind of spend my 15 minutes focused on dissecting his, his work. And so that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to focus on my work, but in conversation with Rogers. I think as many of you may know, I've been studying the politics and in particular, the racial politics of young adults for almost for a long time now. <laughs> um, so in this presentation today, I wanna briefly highlight work I'm pursuing with a string of other co-authors on the politics of young whites. I wanna present this work because we might think of it as being in conversation with Rogers' work on the creation and evolution of whiteness and white kind of racial politics. I also wonder if it complicates or maybe updates what I would call the messy dichotomy Rogers and Des present uh, in first in their work, uh, in their article on racial orders. Uh, so with the time allotted, I wanna talk a bit about a trend we're seeing in our data on young whites, their perceived loss and vulnerability and how such positioning leads to a phenomenon we're calling white vulnerability racism leading them to embrace candidates like Trump and really racist public policies. Now I'm, I'm highlighting this concept because it seems to be competing with the dominance of racial resentment as a way to understand race and racism among white Americans. When we focus our attention on, young, on the politics of, of young people and more specifically young adults, um, we see really the racial evolution in this country that they have witnessed and represent. In many ways, I think they personify the kind of ongoing struggle between the racial orders of white supremacy and the egalitarian transformative racial order that Rogers and Des uh, wrote about. It was really after the 28, 2008 election where significant majorities of white youth turned out to vote for President Obama that uh, people began to kind of write or speak a new narrative of racial transformation. In response to Obama's win, we were told that the millennial generation in particular would save the day when it comes to the racial divide. More forcefully, we were told in some cases promised that white millennials were different when it comes to race. Their support somehow of Obama signaled not only the end of the Republican party, funny, um, but the coming end of racism and the promised colorblind society. All right, so let me share my uh, screen. This is gonna be interesting. Okay, it worked, right? Everybody can see that? Thumbs up. Okay, now I wanna be clear uh, that public opinion data confirms that millennials and more broadly young adults, millennials and Gen Zers, tend to be the most tolerant generations, embracing ideas of diversity and inclusion at higher rates than previous generation. This slide shows the different levels of generational support for interracial marriage. The distinct historical specificity of having grown up in the kind of post Jim Crow and post civil rights era with hip hop and social media as part of their political context suggests that we would expect young adults to be different from, uh, for example, baby boomers in their racial posture. However, our data from Gen Forward suggests that despite some young white people moving into the streets to protest with folks of color in the summer and fall of 2020, it's probably too early to turn the generational page on the history of white supremacy and white racism. If we look at two slides, I think we can begin to see the nuance and racial thinking among white millennials. Um, the first slide asks if racism remains a major problem in our society. And across race and ethnicity, majorities of millennials say yes to that question. <clears throat> this seems like a fairly straightforward finding, one that points to the racial progress promised by journalists and some scholars. It is, however, when we look at the second slide that we begin to see the contours of a different relationship to race, namely perceived discrimination and what we're beginning to label kind of vulnerability among white millennials. So far from discrimination being the purview of BIPOC communities, nearly a majority of young whites <clears throat> believe that discrimination against whites has become as big of a problem as that faced by blacks and other minorities. 
This, I think we would say, is the seeding for what we're calling white vulnerability racism, or the idea that one's perceived vulnerability can lead to a process of othering as protection. But I want to very quickly run us through uh, some slides on the 2016 presidential election to kind of illustrate this um, idea, okay? So according to exit polls, uh, a plurality of young whites, approximately 48% voted for Trump in comparison to 43% who voted for Clinton. People often have those reversed. Our data and subsequent analyses of, of voter validated data suggest that maybe the number was closer to 45%, but still a significant percentage of young whites voted for Trump. The question we were interested in was exactly what motivated young adults, young white adults to kind of break with their peers of color and vote for Trump and break with their earlier pattern of voting for Obama. More specifically, how did racial and economic considerations and the idea of vulnerability possibly influence their vote choice? Researchers such as sociologist Arlie Hochschild, political scientist Catherine Kramer, you know, have argued that a sense of economic loss was at least part of what moved the white working class, we are told, away from the Democratic Party and, and toward a candidate like Trump. However, those narratives of vulnerability or loss felt by the white working class usually focus on older white Americans. So we wanted to see if the perceived vulnerability that we were measuring among young whites was significant in driving support for Trump. Okay, so to measure white vulnerability among young adults, we constructed a scale, Kornback Alpha of 0.6, that had three uh, components. The first was whether whites were economically losing ground through no fault of their own. The second was the earlier slide you saw or question you slide about whether uh, whites were uh, facing as much discrimination as blacks and other minorities. And the third, uh, if minorities are overtaking whites as the majority of the US population, would it strengthen or weaken the country, okay? We were also interested in trying to understand if white vulnerability was different from what we understand to be traditional racism or racial resentment as it's measured in the social sciences, right? So we included measures of what political scientists call racial resentment in our models. Now, as sure as everybody here knows, racial resentment questions have been found to be much more effective in measuring white racial attitudes, especially toward black Americans, right? These questions allow whites to kind of register their contempt for the perceived moral failures of Black Americans, um, such as their purported violation of traditional values, such as individualism, hard work, and self-reliance. Okay, to assess the impact of racial attitudes on support for Trump, we use the standard measures of the abbreviated racial resentment scale. Two questions, the first one is about Irish, Italians, and Jews um, working their way up. Blacks should do the same without any special favors. The second one is about, oh, 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 oh sorry. The second one is about generations of slavery uh, uh, and discrimination that have created conditions difficult for Blacks to work their way up. Okay, so let me say that our analysis revealed a lot of things, but most importantly for this discussion, our measure of white vulnerability stood out among other explanations of support for Trump, okay? Specifically, when we control for a number of other factors which might lead white millennials to vote for, for Trump, such as party ID, ideology, whether you live in the South, employment status, and yes, racial resentment, we find that white vulnerability is the largest predictor of vote for Trump, more so than racial resentment. However, the impact of white vulnerability is not confined to support for Trump, right? It's also evident when we're looking at white millennial attitudes towards, for example, immigration and anti-immigrant views. And while this all kind of fits the economic anxiety and white working class na narrative that's been popularized, right, since the, since the 2016 election, our data suggests that this is not a story of, of economic vulnerability. We all know that. So what drives uh, feelings of white vulnerability? Well, far from being economically vulnerable, 86% of white millennial Trump voters report being employed, and they were less likely to be low income relative to non-Trump uh, white voters. In our analysis, other factors held, um, uh, held equal employment and income are not significant predictors of white vulnerability, right? We find instead that uh, racial anxiety, not surprising, seems to be fueling feelings of vulnerability, 
Our analysis of young whites, of course, comports with other work from scholars such as Michael Tesler, John Sides, Ashley Jargina, who also find that racial resentment is the most significant predictor of a politicized white identity. In our case, while we see similar patterns among millennials, we find that for this group, white identity or whiteness is being refracted through the frame of white vulnerability. Thus, racial progress marked by increased immigration, the growing visibility of BIPOC communities, movements led by queer folks of color demanding an expansion of resources and rights, as well as the election of America's first African-American president and, and, and the restructuring of the domestic economy through globalization, neoliberalism, and any number of other factors has complicated what many whites, in particular young whites, see as their future. And as we've heard, uh, we've heard this repeatedly in focus groups we've performed. Moreover, the feelings of vulnerability on the part of some of our white respondents is not necessarily generated by actual loss, but instead the kind of pending shift in power narrated daily in the mainstream press from Fox News to MSNBC. White millennials as part of America's most diverse generation may be more actually in tune with and more aware of changing demographics of the country. Thus, not unlike past generations, racial resentment today is still a key characteristic of white attitudes, even among young white people. But what is different about today is the racial resentment, is that the racial resentment of past generations came from a position of perceived strength. For many whites who registered high on racial resentment, their negative normative judgment towards blacks came from a position of dominance demanding those others conform to their values, their culture, and their country. Today, white millennials face a different political landscape where not only are the cultural and social scenes increasingly defined by people of color, but the dominant group position of whites, which in the past could be assumed without being acknowledged, thus the supposed absence of racial group consciousness and link fate among whites. Today, their group, or whiteness is now uh, in full view, being interrogated, made visible through protests and memes and its future, and the future of white millennials uh, is uncertain. Okay, let me just say a few concluding remarks and then we'll go on to the next person. Um, the embrace of vulnerability among whites, I would argue is new, right? In the past, their scorn and gaze were kind of outwardly projected most often towards blacks through anti-black racism and what social scientists of course call ra racial resentment. Now I wanna argue there's a competing concept to racial resentment, namely white vulnerability racism. At least that's, that's what I'm gonna claim. And here I think we're focused on the articulated vulnerability of young whites who see at least, and maybe they're told that there's a kind of approaching horde that will bring with them a shift in power, both for whites and those others. Um, Jennifer Richardson calls it the democratization of discomfort, noting there were whole swaths of people uncomfortable all the time. Now we're democratizing it. Now more people feel different of different races and religions feel uncomfortable, end quote. So thus white youth confront a kind of perplexing choice, I'm gonna say, when it comes to resistance relative to vulnerability. Is their goal the reinsertion of power over, or might we imagine a world where we, can, or a, a, a power with what feminist scholars have called the kind of redistribution of a generative vulnerability? This I think is a kind of tricky proposition because the instinctive move is to struggle to assert dominance over even using the framework of vulnerability. However, instead of the instinct toward the reinstatement of power, might we find ways to use vulner the vulnerability of young whites to generate in them a new way of aligning within political solidarity, for example, with communities of color. Now to this question, I wanna show one more slide, I promise. In this slide, what we find is that white vulnerability actually leads young whites to participate in protests uh, the protests that we witnessed in the summer and fall of 2020, and it leads them to support calls for abolishing the police. Now you should note, um, anyway. So Rogers, th now this may be a stretch, but uh, I actually see this work in conversation with you. To me, it builds on the insights you provided in civic ideals about the constructed nature of whiteness, 
and the enticements provided when the expansion of the category was necessary, giving people access to what Du Bois and later Rodinger, Rodinger discussed as the wages of whiteness. In this work, we see yet another generation of white Americans vulnerable, yet grasping onto the promise of power through the reinstatement of an older racial order, leading them to support policies and politicians that are rooted in racism and white supremacy. But in the last slide on protests and support for abolishing the police, I wonder if there is the possibility of harnessing white vulnerability for good. Might this moment of fragility, not the white fragility stuff, but um, among young whites be a kind of moment to connect them to the possibility of collaboration, of empathy and reimagining the democratic project? Might this moment of fragility provide an upper hand, we might say, for the egalitarian transformative order you and Des wrote about in your article on the racial orders? So finally, might your multiple traditions article also provide an example of how to wrestle with the kind of conflicting but real multiple positionalities of young whites, both suffering from advanced capitalism. So the vulnerability is actually real and also longing for white supremacy that will benefit them, right? I, I really do believe that your work provides us with new ways to understand and interpret the politics of young white Americans and I'm gonna look forward to your comments on the presentation. Okay. I'm Thanks, done. Kathy. Thanks. Thanks mm -hmm. so much. Um, mm -hmm. As we transition to Des King, let me just interject and say for those getting on the call that after our panelists uh, make their remarks, there'll be a general uh, question and comment period. We hope you'll be involved and engaged. Just raise your hand after the three panelists go and you can be called upon. There's a lot of people on the call, a lot to discuss. And also, since we do have the Zoom chat function, if anyone wants to share a more personal reflection about Rogers, please feel free to do that. We can compile those and give those to him after the conference. So uh, we turn to you now, Des. Thank you. Thank you. Can you hear me? Yep. Great. Good. OK. Thanks very much. God, that was a really good paper. It was really interesting. Um, and <laughs> I'm of course, delighted to be at a conference celebrating Roger's work and his legacy. Um, I've been very fortunate to collaborate with Roger's for almost two decades and to be his, I think to be his friend and uh, uh, Mary's and uh, their family. And it's been very special indeed. However, I haven't come here to be just nice. Um, what I shall do is focus on the, uh, though I mostly will be nice, I want to focus on uh, Roger's classic 1993 paper, um, Beyond de Tocqueville, Merdell and Hartz, The Multiple Traditions in America, which uh, Kathy has ended with. So uh, there's a little bit of nice transition here, I think. And this was published in the American Political Science Review in 1993, and which I note is neither the first nor the last of Roger's four gripping papers in that August journal, the most recent of which appeared last year. Now the papers, when I read this, the paper's intellectual and analytical significance immediately bowled me over. Firstly, it was a brilliant rebuke to the American exceptionalism thesis, which guided so many accounts of American political development. Second, the paper's analysis of multiple traditions provided a means to place racial division as constitutive of the US political system, of the US polity, in a decisive and forceful scholarly way. And third, miraculously, it appeared in the APSR, the pinnacle of the discipline. I didn't think political scientists could carry on with the prevailing teleological account of American progress from the declaration to liberal individualism in the aftermath of this paper's publication. Roger's thesis of multiple traditions was innovative and groundbreaking. The argument proved agenda setting and fortified American political development as an intellectual rival to existing behavioral and rational choice approaches to the study of US politics. Uh, as our mutual friend, James Marone, just said to me last week, who's visiting Oxford, he, he, and I told him about this event and he, he remembered a seminar at Brown where after the paper's appearance, they routinely started saying there were three approaches now to the study of American politics, behavioralism, rational choice, and the Smith approach. And I think it has been hugely absorbed into the discipline. Now, the argument that Rogers makes in uh, multiple traditions um, 
has been influential and widely used. His core point, I think, is um, continue to have continued resonance, uh, indeed, as, as Kathy has hinted. Um, and I take the, the, core, um, the core point to be the neglect of inegalitarian ideologies in accounts of American development, or as Rogers writes in a key observation, quote, that for over 80% of US, histories, US history, its laws declared most of the world's population to be ineligible for full citizenship solely because of their race, original nationality, or gender. For at least two thirds of American history, the majority of the domestic adult population was also ineligible for full citizenship for the same reason. This bold challenge to the dominant Tocquevillian narrative of American politics disputed what Rogers characterized quite rightly as, quote, the flat plane of American egalitarianism. To accommodate and properly engage the narr narrowness of this narrative required a fundamental revision to acknowledge that, quote, American politics is best seen as expressing the interaction of multiple political traditions, including liberalism, republicanism, and ascriptive forms of Americanism, which have collectively comprised American political culture without any constituting it as a whole. And the paper, as everyone will know in the audience, the paper elaborates and brilliantly defends this fresh account. Undergraduate and graduate courses about American politics in the, in the UK, where I'm located, and Europe, invariably get, begin with a reading from de Tocqueville and a question about American exceptionalism. With immense relief, I was able to displace this standard practice and to be, begin courses with Roger's APSR paper as the main reading. I assumed this would happen elsewhere, including amongst Americanists teaching in the US. The implications of the analysis seem to me to be so profound and far reaching that scholars and teachers would have no choice but to abandon at least significantly uh, or at least significantly modify their frameworks to recognize how the multiple traditions argument revised views about what constituted American ideological tropes and material conditions. And of course, civic ideals affirm this originality and depth even, um, uh, even more. Now, achieving intellectual influence makes multiple traditions and subsequent initiatives, such as the 1619 Project, a political target. The 1776 Commission, set up by Trump in the twilight of his presidency, was part of the arsenal used in this respect. I won't go into the details of this discredited commission with its membership of non-professional historians, but just note that its only report, which was issued on the 8th of January, 2021, note the date, call for the inevitable return to, quote, Americans, America's exceptional principles, end quote, by minimizing the founders' protection of enslavement, rejecting arguments about systemic racism, and bizarrely finding in John C. Calhoun's writings, the origins of affirmative action. Mercifully, President Biden speedily disbanded the commission by executive order. Bereft of intellectual or academic credibility, the 1776 Commission's purpose is political and a powerful reminder of the political significance of Rogers' reconfiguration of American political development narratives and his challenge to political theory from the multi, multiple tra tradi uh, traditions framework. Rogers' work has helped drive a massive reconsideration of the US's, the timing and nature of the US's origins and a sharp extension in the time period used by scholars of American political development. He carefully calibrated the enlightenment and Puritan origins of the US to, to compel scholars to engage with the ascriptive inegalitarian uh, ideology that was part of this. His analysis now addresses issues, I think, in two directions. Historically, in the important 1619 Project's thesis about the US's origins, and contemporaneously in the post George Floyd killing resurgence in reparations demands and critical assessments of Americans process of democratization. Let me highlight three aspects of these two sorts of challenges, the way things have gone historically and the current moment. First, a group of scholars have quite rightly gone back, gone back further than the 1770s and de Tocqueville's account of the institutions created them to focus on 1619, when the first enslaved black persons arrived in, the, um, in North America. 
This project, I think, deepens the arc of North American development, correctly putting the Declaration, Articles of Confederation, and the Constitution as important events in a continuing development, but not as origins. What went into those documents reflected more of the two previous centuries than appreciated when Rogers was writing in the 1990s. There is a growing demand, I think, to reckon with the fact that the US was built on stolen lands and that this process of dispossession indeed involved genocide. Thefts such as the 1737 walking purchase dispossessing Lenaps of their lands in Pennsylvania and more, more familiar examples from the 19th century ignites a deeper probing of settler colonialism. The 1619 project and enslavement is now in the forefront of these historical reckonings, but settler colonialism is also on the agenda. There is no doubt about the intellectual, ideological, political and economic significance of the founding documents drafted in the 1770s and 1780s as expressions of multiple traditions and ideas, some of which have proved indispensable political and intellectual resources for civil rights reformers, so the interesting challenge will be how, how this significance looks with reflection on the two previous centuries. The 1619 project, it seems to me, complements the essence of multiple traditions by confirming the centrality of enslavement in US history. Will, will the issue of settler colonialism become recognized as equally constitutive? And it, if it is, how does this fit the multiple traditions thesis? Second point I want to think about is, is um, a liberalism and the way it's discussed. Does liberalism as a doctrine at work during the 1770s need fresh scrutiny? The attention to the pre-1770s in, in turn has facilitated new studies of the founders and their motives, with more emphasis on, the, on their direct interest in protecting slave-owning slave -owning interests. Books such as The Framers' Coup and The Slaveholders' Union are examples of important studies arguing, I think pretty persuasively, that these interests were more consequential and motivational than previously accepted. We know more about the number of slaveholders at Philadelphia, and we know more about their mentalities toward propertyless people. Many of the signers, for instance, purchasing and importing indentured workers and bonded servants. Jefferson and Washington were routinely ordering for delivery and seeking to purchase indentured Europeans as they worked on the Constitution and pushed the polity into its early, early years, while John Quincy Adams picked up a couple of German indentured workers to be domestic servants. Fresh research on Locke puts him incontrovertibly and without raising objections on the Board of Trade meetings in which the purchase and sale of enslaved persons was conducted thinking particularly of the work of Mark Goldie at, um, at Cambridge. The inconsistency of these practices with liberalism, I think probably bears further reflection, pointing to some limits of, of classical liberalism as we understand it. And the relevance of the late Charles Mills's work is, is obvious here on racial contractualism, perhaps all, but perhaps also to the relevance of some class analysis given these sorts of distinctions. Third, as taken up in the racial orders framework, multiple traditions helps explain the persistent recurrence of the fault line between advocates and opponents of civil rights, and belatedly between those supporting a strong federal role in achieving civil rights and those resisting this sort of forceful engagement. The division between a colorblind policy alliance and in Justice Sonia Sotomayor's term a race targeted policy alliance, which emerged from the major legislative changes of the 1960s, has been sharply repitched since 2010 into a division between what, what Rogers and I have called white protectionist advocates and advocates of a very broadly conceived racial reparations agenda, agenda which extends into fundamental issues of criminal justice, policing, incarceration and voting rights. The ascriptive and illiberal multiple traditions which are part of Rogers' account, continue to shape political contest and to feed into this reconfiguration instead of the eradication of the vestiges of inegalitarianism. Political developments since the May 2020 killing of George Floyd in Minneapolis have made a raft of issues salient, including two, I would mention, institutional racism 
and American democratization. On the former, on systemic racism, the public intellectual and scholar, and indeed poet, Claudia Rankine highlights what she calls the problematic of, quote, internalized white dominance, a description she prefers to white privilege, which she judges too associated with class advantage. Rankine's preferred term of internalized white dominance conveys, quote, that we are inside a culture that is dedicated to whiteness and its dominance over other people. And I know she set up a center about this at, at, at Yale with her MacArthur money. Of course, this is a vast intellectual project studying, studying this um, fault line, but there are many measures of institutional racism which can be identified and specified empirically to confirm the dominance Rankine is addressing. I think she is trying to give some ballast, even more ballast to the 1619 project. A final area of study in which the constitutive role of racial orders is neglected is in democratization studies. Um, of which I, I see Rob Lieberman in the, uh, uh, in the audience that his recent book with Suzanne Meckler is an outstanding example. Um, his, uh, Rob's book and others uh, now amount to a scholarly literature on how democracies fade, democratic backsliding and so forth. But in a terrific essay in, um, in the annals, uh, the, the Journal of the American Academy of Political and Social Sciences, the political scientist at uh, UW Megan Ming Francis highlights what she calls democratization's greatest weakness in America, state sanctioned killing of black citizens. A weakness which the Black Lives Matter protests have highlighted and has been this, and, um, something that has been the subject of important research by, um, by Lisa Miller, who I think is also in the, in the audience. Megan, Megan Francis notes that the comparativists working on democratization emphasize the danger of state-sponsored violence as a destabilizing factor in building a liberal democracy. Yet, quote, scholars of American politics do not usually treat it as a durable threat to democracy. This is a challenge to our present time and how the multiple traditions identified by Rogers continue to impose limits on the content of American democratization um, as a process which should be expected to deliver universal rights of citizenship. In conclusion, the favorite two words of, uh, for any, any um, audience at a conference, uh, it is a huge pleasure to discuss one aspect of this extraordinary body of scholarship and to recognize again how brilliantly Rogers transforms common understanding of American political development, political theory, and democracy. However, as I have indicated here, there is still much to be done, and so I welcome Roger's formal retirement as the basis for ensuring we have much more of his work to read in coming years. Thank you. Thanks. So now we'll turn to Adolf, um, and then questions and comments from the audience. So keep your questions uh, ready and think about them. This is an amazing opportunity given the scholars we have assembled here and the, the um, poignance of the topic that's being discussed. So forward hearing from the rest of you after Adolf Reed. Oh, hi. Um, it, I trust everyone can hear me. Good. Um, yeah, well, I want to thank everyone who's responsible for um, having organized this event and especially Jeff for having invited me to be on this panel. I, there's no way I could say no and I'm honored to be here. Uh, I'll I'll just begin it with just a couple of moments of reminiscences or rep reminiscences about our years together. Uh, um, uh, some of you know that uh, you know, Rogers and I came up through the ranks together from lowly assistant professors whom no graduate students would bother to enroll in our seminars because uh, they were all waiting to get their last piece of doll and Lane and Lindblom and after before they left the scene. Um, and through many, many um, turns and pulls and pushes and you know, whatnot, among other things, I became uh, uh, um, a second tier, um, I'm a Michigan State basketball fan. Uh, and then there's all the family stuff. I would never have in my life been in an Episcopal church if it had not been for a christening. Uh, once uh, you know, Smith became the Smith Summers household and so forth and so on. And I'm really sorry I can't be there for the reception this afternoon, but I'll be back home in a couple of weeks and I hope you guys will be around so we can pick it up then. 
Um, so I, I'm not going to talk about racial identity so much as about race itself as an idea, as a kind of social classification. Uh, I mean, nearly everyone nowadays is likely at least to give lip service to um, the statement that race does not denote naturally occurring populations. Um, how, however, as we all know, things can fall apart pretty quickly after that initial statement. And that's not least because as critics like, like the sociologist Rogers Brubaker and Mara Loveman and the historian Barbara Jean Fields have observed even much scholarly work on, on, on a topic fails to distinguish race as a category of practice, uh, you know, that is the everyday folk re reification through which people in a given society and time, time and place um, make sense of and reproduce the pattern of, of, of the pattern of social relations in which they are enmeshed and race as a ca category of analysis, that is the tools that we use to disenchant those everyday folk understandings. That conflation undermines the anti-essentialist catechism, race is not, um, uh, uh, or race as a social construction, I guess is the way I should do it. Um, uh, uh, because as Fields point out, points out, quote, only if race is defined as, as innate and natural prejudice of color, does its invocation as a historical explanation do, do more than, than repeat the question by way of answer. Uh, as, as she notes further, that when virtually the whole of society, including supposedly thought, thoughtful, educated, intelligent persons, commits itself to belief in propositions that collapse into absurdity upon the slightest examination, the reason is not delusion or hallucination, but ideology. Um, and ideology is impossible for anyone to analyze rationally who remains trapped, trapped, in its, trapped on its terrain. Thus, as Loveman points out, uh, re rejection of race as an analytical concept fa facilitates analysis of the construction of race as a practical category uh, without reification, and thus provides a degree of analytical leverage uh, that tends to be foreclosed when, when, when race is used analytically. So what I want to try to do uh, you know, today is to focus on how it makes sense for us to think about what race is and perhaps even more importantly, isn't, and a bit on the role that social science has played in generating and mystifying the notion and, and, and contributing to the mischief that it produces in the world. Um, so, so first of all, I'm gonna stress that race is a taxonomy or a discourse of, of ascriptive hierarchy. Um, race, that, that is, it's a taxonomy of ascriptive difference, which is a formulation actually that I owe to Rogers, although he left it behind. I suspect because it's an unwieldy mouthful, uh, but like I just have this Germanic tendency that, that, that gives me a higher degree of tolerance for those unwieldy mouthfuls, I think. Uh, but that is to say that race is an ideology that constructs populations as groups and sorts them into hierarchies of capacity, civic worth, and desert based on uh, putatively natural or, or essential characteristics that are attributed to them. Uh, such ideologies of um, ascriptive difference help to stabilize the social order by uh, legitimizing its hierarchies of wealth, power, and privilege, in, including its social division of labor as the natural order of things. Um, uh, Ascriptive ideologies are just so stories with, with the potential to become self-fulfilling prophecies. They emerge from self-interested common sense as folk knowledge. Um, they, are known, they are known to be true un, unreflectively because they seem to comport with the evidence of quotidian experience. They are, they are likely to become generally assumed as self-evident truth and imposed as such by law and custom when they converge with and reinforce the interests of powerful strata in the society. Since it's settled into its familiar social meaning over the sec meanings in, in the US over the second half of the 19th century, race has been a discourse of human classification linked to a particular regime of ascriptive hierarchy. Regimes of ascriptive, hi of, of ascriptive hierarchy, that is again, those based on putatively natural differences like race and gender uh, 
mediate and manage this stratification system by defining populations and assigning them again ascriptively to a, 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 by you know, on the basis that it is what they supposedly are instead of what people within them do, um, and assigning them to appropriate niches of, 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 of civic worth and entitlement. Such hierarchies evolve and are enforced formally through laws, public policies, and quasi-official means, such as officially tolerated but unofficially en en enacted preferences and coercion, and informally through popular ideologies, social practices, and normative sanctions. Regimes of ascriptive hierarchy, that is, derive their uh, legitimacy from the presumption that manifest inequalities reflect a natural order in which people are where they belong in the society because of the types of people they are rather than what they do. As, now, as a particular narrative of, of natural hierarchy, race, um, I argue, experienced its heyday between the last two or three decades of the 19th century and the first three or four decades of the 20th century, uh, depending on where you are. Um, and I believe it's telling, therefore, that those contemporary scholars and commentators who wish to stress racist transhistorical, if not purely transcendent, power for producing un unjust inequality, for example, uh, you know, legal scholar Michelle Alexander and her argument about mass incarceration as the new Jim Crow, um, commonly resort to analogy with slavery or the segregation era in lieu of evidence for ostensibly causal claims uh, re uh, uh, re regarding the causal primacy of, of racism as an abstraction in, uh, in producing contemporary inequalities. Um, but maybe that's something we can talk about in, in, in Q&A. Um, during that period, that is the last several decades of the 19th century, first several decades of the 20th, um, both dominant elites in the West and many of their opponents presumed that race conferred perspectives, values, and social capacities. That is, that it thus defined political, social, and economic destiny. Biological metaphor was more powerful in politics than at any time before or since, although I'm holding my breath because I think it can be coming back again. Uh, Race-like discourse spread far beyond the standard three to five continentally based uh, phenotypic uh, taxa, or even um, the typologies for, or, or, or the phenotypically based typology for defining difference. E eugenicists, for example, construed frighteningly elastic catalogs of biologically transmissible human traits and behaviors that threatened racial uh, degeneration and therefore needed to be suppressed um, along with the specific populations that supposedly carry those, those traits. Strictly biological narratives of, of uh, the racial hierarchy gradually lost, lost interpretive power over the 20s and 30s. Uh, a common liberal folk narrative re represents this shift as the success of a progress, of progressive in, in, enlightenment with lowercase e um, against benighted prejudice, but the retreat of scientific racism as, as historian Eliezer Barkin has uh, described it, um, was, was just that, a retreat, not, not a rout or a defeat, and was the complex, not at all neatly coherent result of a variety of overlapping or, or of a variety of factors that overlap the political, ideological, and scientific. Going back to Franz Boas's um, original pre-World War I challenge to conventional notions of racial evolution, an anti-racist discourse distinguished culture from biology as a more plastic framework for, uh, um, for understanding apparent variation among groups. Uh, anthropologists increasingly have seen culture as fluid, a pragmatic set of open-ended syncretic Practices and mentalities that do not yield a sharp uncross or do not yield sharp uncrossable boundaries uh, between populations. From this perspective, culture is dynamic and processual. But to the extent that it also has been understood as a definitive characteristic or property of peoples, the culture idea reinforces the essentialism that is the core of the race idea. 
Culture can, in that sense, signify durable, ambiguously e essential differences that affect the, the social performances and characteristics of natural populations. In fact, this understanding was always available in, in the culture idea, even when it was deployed as an explicit challenge to, to biological race theories. Uh, George Stocking Jr., historian of the anthropology notes, when in a writing about the birth of the cultural idea in the early 20th century, that the notion never fully escaped the presumptions of race theory, uh, to quote Stocking, culture in its anthropological sense provided a func functionally equivalent substitute for the older idea of race temperament. It explained all the same phenomena, but did so in strictly non-biological terms, and indeed its full efficacy as an explanatory concept depended on rejection of, of the inheritance of acquired characteristics. For race, read culture or civilization. For racial heritage, read cultural heritage. And the change had taken place. From implicitly Lamarckian racial instincts to an ambiguous centuries of racial experience to a purely cultural centuries of, of, of tradition was a fairly easy transition, especially when the notion of racial instincts had already largely been, been based on centuries of, of experience and uh, tradition." Uh, end quote. In critical examinations of cultural pluralism and its origins in, in, in the interwar years, lit, lit scholar Walter, scholars, Walter Ben Michael and Werner Solers, ironically, we have to depend on the lit scholars for these observations, um, historicized the, dis, the displacement of biological race by cultural race as a grounding metaphor of essential group difference in American life. As race science's explanatory failures and the mounting critiques by Boazians and, and others destabilized arguments for group hierarchy based on biological heredity, culture appealed in, in, in effect as race shorn of, quote, the, the embarrassments of blood, end quote, as Michaels put it. And Michaels argues that cultural pluralism was a central element in race's reformulation as culture. From its origin, that notion has been associated with liberal egalitarian tolerance, and more recently, even celebration of difference. As Solers um, puts it, uh, um, quote, the term pluralism has always been used contrastively against racist ogres, end quote. But he and Michaels point out that pluralism hinges on presumption of essential group identities that define populations by fundamental and irreducible difference, no, no, no less than does race. Pluralism seems to be more egalitarian, both because it has more often been linked to a rhetoric of tolerance of difference and because it obviates the hard and fast discourse of biological hierarchy. Yet, yet it remains racialism's foundational premise or it, it retains rather racialism's foundational premise of literally in inherent in the sense that culture like race is a quality that lives within the individual rather than a mutable product of his or her actions and, and beliefs, Un unbridgeable differences. Conceptually, Michaels argues that all, although the move from racial identity to cultural identity appears to replace essentialist criteria of identity, who we are, with performative criteria, what, what we do. The commitment to pluralism requires, in fact, that the question of who we are continue to be understood as prior to questions about what we do. Cultural pluralism in invokes the identity of the group as the grounds for justification of the group's practices. To, to that extent, it is only for the pluralist that identity is absolutely crucial, since only the pluralist striving to see the different as, as neither better nor, nor worse must like it or dislike it on the basis of its difference alone. Thus, it is precisely this pluralism that transforms the substitution of, 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 of culture for race into the preservation of race, because pluralism reifies culture by fastening it to group identity. Um, you therefore, and if you bear with me, I'll quote M Michaels again here, in, insofar as the appeal to culture was genuinely pluralist, insofar that is, as it did not involve preferring any one set of cultural practices on the grounds of its being superior to the other, racial identity remained an essential component of cultural identity. For in, 
for in cultural pluralism, our preference for our own practices can only be justified by the fact that they are ours. Our desire to do things our community does can only be justified by the fact that, 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 that they are ours. So the assertion of cultural identity depends upon an identity that cannot be cultural. We are not Jews because we do Jewish things. We do Jewish things because we are Jewish. Cultural pluralism is thus committed in principle to identity essentialism, which is to say that, that in cultural pluralism, culture does not constitute identity. It reflects or more precisely e e expresses it, end quote. So cultural pluralism's racist, racialist foundations are clear in the formulations of Harvard philosopher Horace Callan, who pioneered the notion during the interwar years. Solers underscores that for Callan, cultural pluralism rests on a quasi eternal static units on the distinctive of the individuality of each nacio, on ancestry, on homogeneity of heritage, uh, of heritage mutuality um, of, and, and uh, interest, and mankind's psychophysical in, in, inheritance. Callan constructed cultural groups as natural populations uh, defined, by, uh, uh, defined by essential differences. In, in his view, those uh, definitive differences are heritable, um, albeit in the vague in, in indeterminate way of ne neo-Lamarckian race theory. And in fact, as late as 1924, Callan openly, em openly embraced the Lamarckian view that characteristics acquired after birth can be passed on through physical in physical inheritance to subsequent generations. Callan's notion of a democratic polity, more, moreover, was decidedly groupist, one that would seek to provide conditions under which each ethnic and cultural group might attain the cultural perfection that is, quote, proper to its kind. To the extent that in its purview, each, each group is a singular entity, cultural pluralism preserves liberalism's individualist evasion of structured inequalities anchored in historical political economy, and that naturalizes existing hierarchies of social power. As with race relations, cultural pluralism presumes a social and political world in, in which groups reified as individuals confront one, one another on equivalent terms in public life and politics. This perspective bypasses, or in Callan's case, diminishes class and political economic differentiation. He, he asserts that the poor of two different peoples tend to be less like-minded than the poor and the rich of the same peoples. This is, of course, it, it, uh, this is, of course itself a class position. Um, and, I, and, I will, and, and I'll argue below uh, that, that the group is premises that, uh, that uh, you know, underlay cultural pluralism would be articulated in more directly you know, political terms in, as ethnic pluralism in post-war interest group liberalism. By the end of World War II, narratives of biologically based racial hierarchy had been displaced from respectable civic and, intro and intellectual life in the US, at least outside the South. Um, yet that victory was not complete. The egalitarians who were at the forefront of the challenge to biologistic race hierarchies generally had treated the common sense racial populations as given and argued that there were no socially or politically meaningful differences separating them. Whether or not it was strategic, my sense is that it sometimes was and sometimes wasn't, even for a, a single uh, 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 for a single individual like Ruth Benedict or Boas himself, that a rhetorical move left space for ambiguity concerning whether races were natural groups after all. That ambiguity was expressed as well in, in, in assertion of notions of national character that rose to the fore in relation to the campaign for civilian morale and national unity during, during World War II. Uh, distinctions of national character also presumed a race-like discourse grounded on a taxonomy of natural populations defined by distinctive characteristics. Several scholars, maybe ironically, from the Boazian circle, including Benedict, Boaz's and Benedict's former student, Margaret Mead, Mead's anthropologist husband, Gregory Bateson, and Columbia social psychologist Otto Kleinberg, were among those who, uh, prominently involved in articulating notions of national character and reconciling them with, 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 with anti-racist sensibilities. 
Those scholars are certainly scrupulous in arguing that differences in national character were relative rather than absolute and were social and contextual in, in origin. They drew from the new culture and personality approach in anthropology to focus on child raising and early socialization practices as mechanisms that forged distinctive national characters. This move was intended partly to insulate the national character idea from taint of biological racism. Yet, because it preserved the familiar folk categories of racial national difference, it is by no means clear how much effect that, that distinction had on quotidian understandings and, and interpretation. The Boazian victory occurred on terms that did not historicize the race idea or consider its specific foundations in capitalism's class dynamics. On those terms, it contributed to the shaping of post-war liberalism and the notions of racial equality that formed within it. The shift from biology to culture as dominant social metaphor certainly did not challenge the race relations paradigm that displaced considerations of structured inequalities onto the individualist and voluntarist terrain of how groups understood and, 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 and engaged with one another. As articulated into national character, the culture idea could scarcely have been better tailored as an interpretive technology for the management systems of growth liberalism at, at, at home and America's Cold War uh, empire abroad. Pragmatically, race and race theory by the late 19th century, the former hardly could have existed without the latter, had always been mechanisms for constructing populations around definitive characteristics Im imputed to them and on the basis of those constructions, justifying their assignment you know, to relatively fixed positions in hierarchies that drive the processes of social reproduction. The simplest formulation of the logic is that different people get what they deserve based on their capacities and moral worth. Since different groups share different capacities and moral temperaments, it's natural that they would sort, sort empirically uh, into different niches in, in the social order. Common sense understanding derived from quotidian observation of differential sorting, clustering in different categories of jobs or, 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 or in, in residential areas or material standards of living and, and uh, so forth, reinforces the verisimilitude of the theories and vice versa. Race, as either biology or culture and other such ideologies of ascriptive difference make the machinations of class power and politics in invisible by dissolving them into nat natural extra societal conditions and processes. Race, whether elaborated as, as, as biology or culture is such an ideology. In not taking the next step in their critique of racialism to treat it as an organic partly constitutive mechanism of modern capitalism's logic of, of re reproduction, the Boazians fail to get to its root in social structures and ideology. In defeating biology, but leaving space for race theory's relocation to the domain of culture, they also en enable the effective return of a discourse that not unlike Victorian neo-Lamarckianism treated culture as, has treated culture as, as, as the equivalent of biology. So, so this outcome was not simply a function of incomplete or inconsistent ideas. Uh, the processes through which some perspectives gain social traction and others fall by the wayside never are purely idealist in, in that way. As, as Barkin makes clear, the Boazian's victory over biologistic racialism was not simply the product of the strength of their ideas in the abstract or Boaz's talents as an organizer and propagandist. Re reformulated or camouflaged ne neo-Lamarckian racialism succeeded in, in, in the post-war years because it generated institutional support within the academy and, and outside. And it generated that support partly because its adherents, led by intellectual entrepreneurs and, 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 and institution builders, articulated it as a framework with, with appeal for governing elites. M Margaret Mead, for just one example, uh, exulted both in the early 40s and in the early 60s in pointing out the service that na national character studies could perform for elites in, in advancing both their foreign and, and uh, domestic 
policy objectives. Formulation of, of, formulation of economic inequality in a culturalist framework complemented formulation of racial inequality in an ultimately individualist framework of prejudice and intolerance in that each perspective lo lo located the source of inequality outside the political, uh, you know, the political economic and social structures of contemporary American capitalism. Uh, scholars like Leah Gordon of Penn Products uh, and Riri Golubov and, uh, and uh, others have examined concrete facets of this moment. Um, and I mentioned earlier, um, Blatt um, um, from, uh, from the New School. Um, yeah, but also contemporaneous work of people like Oscar Handlin, uh, um, Daniel Patrick Moynihan, Nathan Glazer, and uh, others, and, and, especially, uh, and especially among the social scientists, uh, show clearly uh, and um, what had what what looked for all the world like without being a confessor or a biographer like a, a concerted effort um, to turn class into a category of culture and turn race into a category of culture and to make uh, the political economy I mean disappear. In that sense, those interpretive tendencies were better suited to the regime of pro-growth politics and interest group pluralism than were notions of economic citizenship that emerged around the industrial democratic vision in the 1930s and 1940s. Uh, and they articulated uh, the common sense worldview of policy elites and were moments in, in the evolving constitution of post-war liberalism at, as an ideology. And I can extrapolate that forward to, its, um, to discuss its implications on the present, but I'm out of time and we should save that for Q&A if anyone's interested. Thank you. Thank you all. Um, so now I'll scan the screen here to see if there are any questions or comments from you in the audience. Please don't be shy. Um, and while we wait, for that, those to come in, I'll, I'll get things started by um, putting Kathy and Des into conversation. Um, Des, uh, thinking of your uh, book with Rogers, Still a House Divided, you uh, argue for the importance of not focusing too much on racial attitudes, but on reforming consequences and practices. And with that focus in mind, I'd be curious to get your reactions to Kathy's uncovering of these new growing attitudes of white fragility uh, and white vulnerability. And Kathy, thinking about your contribution, I was struck by the way in which you, of course, define white vulnerability as uh, largely a function of racial anxiety and racial resentment, but yet seem to differentiate it um, conceptually, if not otherwise, from out and out racism. And I was wondering if white vulnerability, how, how it fits is, is a specific type of racism. Is, is it like a more vulnerable type of racism that is more vulnerable in the sense that maybe it is um, more amenable to being educated and pushed back against uh, or in other respects um, different from other forms? So I would uh, raise those questions to the two of you. Maybe to, to you first, Des. Okay, thank you. Um, I mean, I thought I thought Kathy's slides were really interesting and um, seem seem to confirm what a, what if I remember correctly, um, exit polls were showing in 2016 and and more so since then that um, a, a growing proportion of white voters thought that there was discrimination against whites in America in a way which they hadn't before, um, and so as part of the it seems to be really significant as part of the background to how the um, what we what Rogers and I call these policy alliances have have sort of reconfigured since then. Uh, you're giving meat to it, and I I think the the generational material is also that I think it's your first slide, which had the 48 to 52 percent in the youngest group is 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 perhaps the most um, uh, amongst the most significant things um, uh, in in your in your account. Um, you're right that we don't stress attitudes as much as structures, um, Jeff, on that basis. But I think this, I think this, um, Kathy's work, I mean, I've always been impressed by the Tesla arguments about spillover effects and so forth and what he's, 
what what he then showed with his work with the two collaborators in the book that Kathy mentioned, and I think that that was all consistent with it uh, in many um, in many ways. I mean, I very much liked the the data you had. Um, um, so I'm try I know Jeff, you probably want, want me to pick an argument, but I I'm, I I've, I found I found the presentation really compelling um, and, and interesting on that basis. And and um, I I mean I kept thinking that it was consistent with what we're calling this is the rise of this white protectionist uh, alliance. Um, but it seemed to be data that was was consistent with that. But, uh, I'll, I'll jump in. Thanks, Des, uh, for not picking a fight. So um, I, I'll, I guess I'll say a, a couple things. One is I, I want to be clear that our language is white vulnerability racism, right? That in fact, the, the understanding of vulnerability, um, I keep saying is being re refracted through what Tesla and Jardina and others would talk about as a kind of politicized white identity where there is a sense of loss. I think the difference here, and, and maybe it's not that different, we're trying to kind of locate it in uh, a younger generation that we're trying to, first of all, push back against the narrative of generational change with regards to kind of racial structure, we might say, um, maybe the dominance of white supremacy, of a white supremacist order, the kind of, there's a way in which that narrative forgets in fact that these are also young people who grew up as mass incarceration was exploding, who uh, in particular for young people of color as I see Vesla there would say that their experiences are more with the carceral state than the liberal state, right? Um, and so we just wanna complicate how we understand kind of the trajectory and the possibility of, of a kind of generation of millennials and Gen Zers that have too often, I think, been represented as a kind of a, a change or uh, in, in the kind of trajectory of racism and anti-Blackness in this country. So that's the first thing. Second thing is we want to say is there are kind of other ways to think about the kind of racism that exists in that generation and others um, besides racial resentment, which is a kind of outward focus uh, framework for thinking about anti-blackness. They don't, you know, um, they don't always talk about it in that way, but that's what it is. And how do we begin to understand, and this is, you know, not to, maybe to Rogers, the kind of uh, multiple positionality of young white people. And really, this is part of a book where I'm trying to think through the generative potential of vulnerability of which feminist scholars have written about, right? There is a possibility that vulnerability they would argue, of course, can, we can do harm, but it can also tie us to each other. It can be a kind of place of collective mobilization and liberation. And part of what I think this framework is trying to do is to say, how do we, as, as young actors, is, how do we hold the multiple positions of young whites and make sense of that? And where do we want to leverage, right? So to recognize, in fact, that you know, maybe to Adolf's point, that if we understand the trajectory of capitalism, if we think about the kind of ways in which globalization has narrowed their job opportunities, or at least changed the types of institutions that control their job opportunities, they're not just national institutions, right? Um, that young millennials and Gen Zers are more likely to be in the gig economy, right? Millennials are the first generation in kind of current economic history that actually may do worse than their parents, right? So to understand both their economic vulnerability as real, but also their desire to resolve this through also racial anxiety and an attachment to the promise of white supremacy that gets articulated by Trump and others as also real, right? Um, that's a kind of racial vulnerability. And so how do we think about both of those in terms of the kind of reaction, which we might call a racism um, that is not just a racial resentment, but also understands the particular vulnerability that these young people are facing. And I'm, I'm going on, I'll stop, but I will say what's been really interesting to me is that many people feel very uncomfortable, and I get it, with me describing white people as vulnerable. They're just like, you just can't do that, right? Relative to other folks. And I, so I'm trying to say it's vulnerability, but it's a vulnerability 
that too often leads to kind of racist outcomes, thus the white vulnerability racism. Thank you. Um, yeah. Great. Um, let's turn now to Vicky Murillo and Matt Roth, if you could um, unmute her. And then you want to unmute yourself, yeah. Okay, thank you. Uh, I feel like, you know, I, I, I feel a little humble to talk here. Everybody knows much more than I do. But I also wanted to, to say, you know, I was an assistant professor at Yale and I benefited enormously from having Rogers and Kathy as colleagues. And they really made me change the way I think, even though I'm not an American politics person or a political theory person. Um, and so uh, it's in that light that I had a, a few questions about, uh, about Kathy's empirical presentation, because I do, I am an empiricist. And, and, and the way you think about intersectionality and that's both about both of your work. So uh, I was thinking about the heterogeneous effects in the data you show. So you're talking about white millennials, but is this the same uh, about like for females? I mean, is, what's the role of gender there? And what is the role of social class that, you know, it's, it was clear in your, in your comments, right? Um, and in particular, it seems to have been so much pushed by the political economy in literature. And, and, and there was one group that I thought was quite interesting in that, in that data, which was the Latinx population. Uh, that's a population that's both white and non-white. So you have the divide within the population and, and, and we carry from you know, the way we are raised and the regions where come that you know, very strong hierarchies, although they are not defined in the same way as they are in the United States, they're more complex, I guess, in a sense. So I was wondering if those could tell us more about this phenomenon of, of white vulnerability and what do they tell us about how the, the US understands uh, you know, this issue of equality of opportunity, which seems to be in the background of the reframing of, of racism as, as white vulnerability. Given the uh, time we're in, I think we'll join that, that wonderful set of reflections from Vicky with comments or questions from Ira Katz Nelson and then give speakers a chance to respond. So Matt, if you could unmute Ira Katz Nelson. Oh, thank you very much. It's, um, first of all, it's just inspiriting to see the extraordinary range of uh, colleagues here to honor Rogers, who has been certainly in my uh, life intellectually and otherwise uh, sort of a, so central a figure. Um, uh, just great to be here. Um, my question is uh, in directly to Des uh, King and then indirectly, I guess, also to Rogers, which uh, reflects on, I want to hear a bit more reflection about the remark you made, Des, about and even pride in substituting um, Rogers' the brilliant and important article of 1993, um, uh, substituting that for a reading of Tocqueville. But one way to read Tocqueville, not Rogers' way to read Tocqueville exactly in that article, um, is to say that um, uh, chapter 10 of book one is precisely a presentation of um, uh, the racist and restrictive tradition in American life, and that, in fact, Tocqueville is a, especially when read with Beaumont's work on slavery, um, that whole trip um, is at the root of thinking about multiple traditions in American life. And the limits of Tocqueville are less that he didn't consider the racial um, dynamics of uh, the early Republic, but more that he never, um, and in fact, he willfully said he didn't, he wasn't able to connect analytically um, the, call it the liberal exceptionalist story to the racial and racist story. Um, and I take it to be one of the great um, challenges of Roger's work of, of forcing us to try to think hard as it is Des in your work of the mutual constitution, the imbrication, the relationships, the times of separation and challenge and the times of mutual constitution of liberalism and racism. But is it, is it not right to read Tocqueville as a multiple traditions person 
rather than simply as um, an exceptionalist um, advocate? Thank you. Uh, those questions seem to be uh, in large measure for Kathy and Des. Uh, so if Kathy, you wanted to say anything to, to Vicky's reflections or-, or Sure, yeah. I'll, I'll, I'll be very brief. First of all, Vicky, it's great to see you. Um, uh, second, I think uh, if we just look at the analysis, we know that gender and at least income are statistically insignificant, which you know, goes to the argument that this is not being driven by kind of the social economic status of individuals. Now, having said that, we do know in later analyses that uh, white men with less formal education are more likely to be kind of positioned around and to gravitate towards vulnerability or this white vulnerability. So it's, it's a little more complicated than represented on the slides. And then just very quickly to the question of what does this say about kind of perceptions of equality? I think it it is the way in which equality has been framed for this generation. One, as I said, they've experienced kind of um, what they understand to be scarcity, we might call precarity in terms of their economic and understanding of equality, where it's not quite a zero sum game, but the idea that in fact, other groups are making progress. And I, and I think generally the way these young white millennials and Gen Zers would position is that we don't care about the progress, we care about the progress that ends up taking from us, right? So if everybody can have a job, and in fact, we see that in other analyses, right? That they, they ask, they demand that the state in fact provide jobs for everybody. They want an expansive state, even though they hate the state. Um, so it is, I think, complicated in the sense of because they understand themselves to be losing because others are in fact advancing, it helps kind of populate this idea of a white vulnerability races. But I'll turn it over to Des. Can I just come back? Um, I mean, I think, I think like any foundational thinker, um, the subtlety there and there's um, more depth and uh, calibration awareness of um, circumstances than gets um, presented in the in the some subsequent readings. I, I think I'd want to say a couple of things. One is um, the abridged version of Democracy in America, which which I was exposed to in, as an undergraduate, um, uh, left out some key chapters. It didn't include the chapter of Native Americans and so forth, but he, he had in it. So so I think that was already being excluded. I, I, I think to defend Roger's multiple traditions, but I'm sure he will as well. It seems to me we're dealing with how de Tocqueville got worked into the narrative subsequently of American liberalism. And um, particularly, I think hearts is crucial and maybe even Nardell with the, with the creed. So um, I'm, 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 going to, I'm going to rush out and look at chapter 10 again uh, uh, immediately, but, but I, I think, um, um, I think he does understand mutual constitution, but I'm not sure that mutual constitution was absorbed into the readings of the top four. And that may not be, um, so that may give him more credit, I think. Um, um, and I think it's worth looking at it again, but I don't think it got absorbed in the way it was, it, it, what was being challenged at the time. Thanks. Sure, thank you. So now let's hear uh, from Katie Rader. Nice to see you. and. Uh, Tim Weaver, nice to see you as well. Um, if you can make your comments or questions and then we'll turn back to the Q to the panelists. Thanks so much, Jeff. It's, it's great to be here uh, uh, and wonderful to be celebrating Rogers. Uh, my question I think is mostly for, for Adolf, but Kathy, I'd be very interested in your questions too. Kind of in putting together your, um, your presentations and commentaries, Adolf, I wonder, uh, how you think about sort of the racial resentment as an idea, how it fits into the, the ideology of the, the sort of race culture or the way you're um, articulating the race culture um, transition here. And I'm particularly hoping that your, uh, your essay that you shared is gonna be in print sometime soon so that I can read it again. Well, yeah, I guess my first response is, uh, you know, which essay is this you're talking about? Oh, just your, just your comments you shared just now. Oh, oh, oh okay. Um, well, yeah, I mean, I think race, well, the idea of race is linked to resentment. 
right? Because it's it it's an expression of scapegoating, right? And I mean, I know it sounds simplistic at this point to talk about race as uh, as a language of scapegoating, but basically that's that's largely or 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 that's the dark side of what ascriptive ideologies do, right? That's part of the work of um, of uh, legitimizing the current set of social relations, right? By showing that people who 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 complain shouldn't be complaining because they are are where they deserve to be, or or it's a famous uh, misdirection that we see more and more uh, absurdly in everyday life in American politics now, right? Like uh, what the abortion fight, um, the CRT fight, right? Um, the trans kids in school fight, right? I mean, these are all, they couldn't be cruder um, expressions of a reactionary political program that makes use of you know scapegoating to get people to look away, uh, so that so so that the political entre political entrepreneurs can shove their hands in their pockets, right? I mean, it's uh, well, I mean, I know it sounds like a simplistic you know explanation, but sometimes the uh, the only thing there is to say about water is that it's wet, right? Um, so in that sense. Yeah, I mean, for me, like I've often felt that one of the, and have said that one of the differences be, uh, between political science and politics is that politics, it, it's kind of um, an amendment of, of the 11th thesis on Feuerbach, right? That the point, point of political science is to explain the world, kind of, or to predict the world, kind of. It doesn't do so great at that either. But the point of politics is to try to make sense of what the driving dynamics are and to figure out how to harness them to change them. So, yeah, I mean, the, the finding of resentment doesn't surprise me, right? Uh, but I mean, not just because that's what race as a category of human what, I mean, differentiation exists to do, um, but also because I haven't been sleeping for the last 40 years, right? 40 years. I want to make sure I said 40 and not four. Right. Um, so, right. So, I mean, the, so in that sense, I think Kathy and I agree that the challenge is to figure out how to find a way to interpret, address, narrate, um, construct responses to the sense of resentment, because it's not like um, um, the, the, the natural expression of resentment that emerges from the pores of so-called white people, who, which is a very big category, by the way, right? I mean, just as black people is a category that's larger than the population of Canada, which I hasten to point out. Um, but it doesn't emerge from the pores as racial resentment, right? It's, what, what this is stoked, it's the work of political agitators and entrepreneurs and, and uh, activists, and I and I got to say, on both sides of, of of the congressional aisle, because the Democrats don't are just about as invested in, in understanding race as a crucial fault line, uh, or, or 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 identity based differences, if you want to call them that, as the crucial fault line in in American politics now, as the Republicans are, and frankly, uh, maybe because my blood sugar might be going off. Well, what I'll just say this, that the, the war in Ukraine is yet more evidence in my view, just how much the Biden, Schumer, Pelosi wing of, of the Democratic Party are willing to do to avoid addressing the economic needs of, of a working people of whatever color, right, in this country. Uh, but that's just the most recent. So yeah, I don't know. So is that the response? Thank you. Um, thank you for that. You know, uh, given our time constraint, why don't we hear from Tim Weaver and Lester Spence and then give all the panelists a, a final uh, opportunity to speak. So thanks, Tim. And then we'll go right to Lester after your questions. Okay, thanks very much, um, uh, everybody. Um, the, the, one of the things which uh, I've always tried to bear in mind when thinking about the uh, multiple traditions thesis and Rogers's claims um, therein is that it's probably, although it, it, it tends to happen almost naturally to think about wanting to categorize particular people 
into each of the three traditions, one of the points that he makes is that, of course, most people all adopt, either for pragmatic reasons or for ideological reasons, um, a multitude of traditions or adopt ideas or policy prescriptions that can pick and choose from among the three traditions. And so rather than trying to say or, or think about Locke, for example, or even Tocqueville um, as, as uh, only being part of one tradition, um, it's not, it shouldn't be necessarily surprising to think that Locke or Tocqueville or indeed anybody else would express or espouse views that could fit into other traditions um, uh, as, as well. And it, and it took me back to, to um, Kathy's last slide there and trying to unravel this, this sort of puzzle or apparent puzzle that shows um, that people with higher scores on um, white vulnerability are also more, more likely to engage in protests, seemingly in solidarity with uh, African. So, um, and so to sort of, to, to, to close the loop, I'm wondering whether part of the, the dissonance is uh, aggravated by the degree to which there is an absence of a language um, or, or uh, to articulate solidaristic claims um, that aren't seen in group terms or in zero sum terms. And so therefore, I think the big challenge is to try and work out, and I think Rogers has been trying to do this, ways in which solidaristic politics can be built through a language that doesn't reduce us to uh, uh, groups that are in a zero sum struggles with one another. Thanks, I just got a quick comment. Uh, first, it was good to see everybody. Um, the comment, two comments, one is, uh, I'm really interested in, rather than the multiple traditions account, which I think has a certain type of power, I'm really much more interested in the racial orders argument, particularly as it relates to the argument that Adolf has been making for years about the role that race plays and or shouldn't play in contemporary politics. So that's the comment. But the second comment is that um, Adolf, you should have let motherfuckers do this shit for, shit for you when you retire. So I know we're doing this for Rogers, but we really should have been doing this for you. So yeah, I'll shut up. <laughs> Roger deserves it. <laughs> um, all right, so final words, we'll just go in order of the initial presentations, Kathy, Des, and Adolf to wrap things up. Thank you I'll, all. I'll be very brief. First of all, I just wanna remind everyone, I heard Adolf Reese say, say, I agree with Kathy. Now that's the first, I think, so okay. I'm gonna hold on to that. I'm gonna hold on to that. All right. Um, the second thing is to say that, I, and, and this is the last, is really that to me, this is a kind of question, and I think to Adolf's point also about how do you leverage and build political solidarity? And are there ways in which we can complicate our understanding of white supremacy and anti blackness, the carceral state, right? All the kind of frameworks that we have to allow a bit more nuance and the ability to leverage, move and organize people to different positions. Um, and while you know, the framework of race is critical to the work I do, I don't want it to be a static framework of understanding people in one specific positionality from which they can't be moved. And I think the work on vulnerability, uh, I presented on, white on young whites, we also do it on young African-Americans, provides us with a, a new framework to think about movement and the building of solidarity. And then uh, the last thing I'll just say is Rogers, thank you. Okay, that's all. Just very quickly, um, coming back to, to, to uh, Lester's first point, um, the, the, the interaction between racial orders and, and uh, um, Adolf's um, more class-centered analysis is, is something that Rogers and I discuss constantly as we're working on, the, on this project and we're doing a new iteration and um, uh, we've been pouring over because I think it's a, it's, it's a vital issue, it really is. And um, I was trying to hint that there's some class analysis, I think, in some of these new studies that are coming up about, about origins that could be the basis for an interesting dialogue um, there. I'm, but 
well, we haven't got time to go through all that now, but I'm, I'm, I think there's a, there's a lot to be to be discussed there. Um, I didn't thank the organizers at the beginning, but many thanks to them. And uh, it's been a really nice day. Thank you very much. Thank you. Adolf, want to end things off for us? Final words? Uh, yeah, sure. Just the last comments. I mean, um, one, I have two comments. One, one is I want to say about um, the, well, the multiple traditions um, um, account. Um, and this is a little bit like a walk down down uh, memory lane, so bear 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 with me. But uh, Rogers and I figured out pretty early that from slightly different directions, we were coming at um, a very largely on an overlapping set of problems and also kind of historical period. Uh, among other things, like we both uh, were firmly committed um, anti-communitarians, and that kind of set things going. But we're also quite inclined to sort of challenge pietistic uh, um, received accounts of post-war social and racial li liberalism, right? I mean, Rogers' early work on a, on a more aggressive reading of the 14th Amendment was, you know, you know, made me quite happy. And, and, and his multiple traditions came parallel to, I'm not claiming any influence on this at all, but came parallel to um, a line of, of scholarly argument that people like Jill Curano, Michael K. Brown, M Michael Katz, um, Ira, uh, and, um, uh, and, and I mean, to some extent, Fran Piven, and to a lesser extent, I, were all also converging around uh, uh, about exploding uh, you know, the simplistic accounts of, 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 of Whiggish um, liberal enlightenment, right? Uh, so, I mean, that was great. Fantastic. Um, uh, my other comment is more like directed toward Kathy uh, or in response to Kathy and like going back to, to Katie and also Lester. Um, and, and it's this, I mean, and it's something I've been saying like for decades, if not generations now, it just seems to me that the way to develop or to start to build the solidarities that, that we obviously need to stop the horrible stuff that's coming down the pike. And I'll just offer this shameless plug. I did an article about a year ago, the title of which was The Whole Country is the Reichstag in, in, in nonsite.org, which I would suggest people take a look at. Um, it's kind of to read the train schedule, basically. Um, but, um, but the only way it seems to me that we can begin to start trying to build the solidarities that we're going to, broad solidarities that we're going to need to stop the worst that could happen to us is through beginning from, from shared experience, from the experiences that people in, in, in this country share most, most broadly. And I've been saying in movement circles for decades, I don't understand how we're supposed to get to the point of solidarity if we have to begin the discussion by going around the room uh, to establish what, what everybody doesn't have, have in common. So that's just my passing shot for an approach to politics. And thanks to everyone, especially Rogers. Yeah, thank you all for being here. Uh, we'll take a break until 1.30 when our third panel will be the construction of national citizenships, competing paradigms. Hope to see many of you there as we continue the conference. Great. Well, in the meantime, take care. <laughs>